Yes, Cathy, make no mistake, with every day that is going by, this is a situation which is getting worse. First things first, infections and deaths today, as Kirsty was saying, was bleak, record-breaking on both counts. Take a look at this. Uh, this is new cases and uh, new deaths uh, throughout the UK. Cases, as you can see, climbed to a new record high at 68,053. The weekly average for cases is up 30%. Go back just a few, three weeks, as you can see there, it's climbed so rapidly, and they've risen 92%, so they've nearly doubled in that time. Deaths as well, you can see on this graph here, also reached a uh, new high today, over 1,300 dying within 28 days of a positive test. Some of that, that's a little bit of catching up over record keeping from the holidays, but the trend, the red line you can see here, unmistakably climbing ever higher. Let's look at hospitalisation too. In every uh, nation of the UK, you can see here on England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, the number of COVID patients in hospital in each different nation. There are now more or very nearly more COVID patients in hospitals in every nation than there were at the April peak. England, 49% more than the English April peak. You can see way above there. Scotland, they're the only ones just under their April peak, but only by, as you can see, a couple of percent and you can see Wales down here has more than double the number of patients in hospital with COVID than they had at their April peak. And Northern Ireland, well, they've got 69% more COVID patients than they had at their April peak, but it's dipping a little bit. The worst picture of all, though, is in London, not only in hospital numbers, but infection too. This is regional uh, positivity rate and the percentage of people in each region uh, of England which are testing uh, positive. There's some evidence it's dipping a little bit in London, but the data we got today shows that uh, it's still way out uh, in front of the rest of the population. 3% of the population testing uh, positive, one in 30. But in some areas of London, like Barking and Dagenham, that's over 6% or one in 15 people testing positive for the virus in that part of London. All of this is why a major incident was declared in the capital today and why hospitals really are at their limit. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. If you look at London, there's some parts where you could already be quite worried that the service isn't coping. You know, there are pockets where Operations that would ne never be cancelled, even at the height of the worst winter, you would never see operations for some cancers where every delay means the worst clinical kind of outcome for a patient already being cancelled. You wouldn't see clinical staff in critical care units being asked to care for the number of patients that they're being asked to care for at the moment. So you're already seeing pockets of extreme pressure in London that are only going to spread. And remember, we haven't even seen the full impact of Christmas yet that's to come. And the worrying thing about all of this as well is that we have some evidence that the policy mechanism to deal with this, the lockdown, might not be quite as effective as it was previously. For example, this is some data that the Transport for London has given Newsnight today, compares tube use in the first week uh, of the first lockdown. That's in the uh, red graph, part of the graph you can see there, compared to the blue part of the graph, which is this week, tube use this week. You can see to take yesterday, this week, there were 1.19 million tube journeys made yesterday. The equivalent day and the equivalent lockdown in March, there was only about half a million, so a big increase. Likewise, this data looks a bit more complicated, also provided to Newsnight, a survey of 6,000 teachers. What it shows is the dramatic difference in school attendance in January this year, this lockdown to March last year. Again, the red uh, part of the graph is the lockdown last year. You can see all of the attendance is bunched towards the early part of, of this graph. Tiny uh, numbers, either very few students uh, appearing in school at all, or between, as you can see, they're one and five percent. This time, much more uh, up this part of the graph, one in five schools are seeing 20 to 30 percent of their kids come through the door. Some down here are seeing more than half. And if the old measures aren't working as well as they did before, there's a worry that if they don't fall significantly, then there aren't that many more levers left to pull. You can have an effect on it, um, and, and, uh, and lockdown definitely will have an effect on it. Um, but we need to do more than just make it plateau out, because at the moment, you know, plateauing out at the same levels as it's already at would mean that we carry on with over a thousand deaths a day, uh, and, and we can't do that, so we do need to decrease it. And that is the real challenge here, to bring down, significantly bring down prevalence of the virus and to do it soon. In their darkest moments right now, epidemiologists are concerned that the combination of the new variant, lockdown fatigue and the ubiquity of the virus means that that might not happen with all the consequences for our health service. They're in. Kirsty. Lewis, thanks very much. Well, in a moment, we'll speak to Professor Susan Meekie, who sits on SAGE and is director of the Centre for Behavioural Change at University College London. 
and Dr. Dan Poulter, Conservative MP and psychiatrist who still works in the NHS as a mental health doctor. But first we're going to hear from Rupert Pearce, an ICU consultant working at a major London Hospital. Uh, good evening to all of you, but first of all, Rupert Pierce, um, you are seeing the impact on your hospital daily. How much worse do you think it's going to get? We don't know. We're very worried about how much worse it's going to get. Um, you talked a lot about the first wave in your peak. It's worth noting that the peak of admissions in the first wave occurred within a couple of three weeks, maybe, and was uh, down to quite low levels by four or five weeks. This wave has been going for more than eight weeks and we still haven't reached the peak. So that, that's really the main reason why we're seeing such vast numbers of patients in hospital. And, and the services on the ground are really tremendously stretched now. And can you see a difference in terms of the patients coming and, and, and the deterioration of their condition? It's hard on the ground to see uh, epidemiological patterns in the types of patients who come in. I think that one of the important messages is this appears to be a disease of all adult ages. We're seeing patients in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, as well as older patients as well. And the idea that this may not affect you because you're too healthy is really a fallacy. And in terms of the staff in your ICU, you're seeing people coming for volunteering, untrained people coming in to help because you need them. Yes, so we would normally run very strictly with one trained intensive care nurse per each patient. We've had to dilute that down as far as one nurse to three patients or even one nurse to four. And we have to backfill that space with uh, trained nurses from other areas who aren't intensive care experts, uh, medical students. And, and this weekend when I was working, even consultant colleagues had to step in to work, as, work alongside our nursing colleagues. To really deliver spoken out. Sorry to interrupt. I know you haven't really spoken out much before now, but you've decided to speak out now. Why do you think this is so critical now? Well, I'm very worried that we've reached a peak and we're really not seeing the kind of behaviour that we saw in the first wave. And I and many of my colleagues in medicine are extremely worried that the peak, the, this surge wave is just going to carry on rising and rising and that we'll reach a point where the NHS simply won't be able to cope with it. And we're particularly worried about opinion leaders chipping away at public confidence in the, in the lockdown measures and the public health measures that we've introduced to try and control the problem. And personally, I find it particularly frustrating as a doctor to see MPs uh, questioning the logic of uh, public health measures when maybe their local hospital in their constituency is full well, bursting with well, patients with Thank COVID. you very much, Professor, because I need to turn right now to Dan Poulter and Susan Meeke. Dan Poulter, just picking up on that, what Pre uh, Professor Pierce has described is actually very grave and indeed frightening. It is, and the situation on the front line is really tough at the moment, particularly in London, but in many other parts of the country as well, in the southeast, in the east of England. Um, what was unusual today was the fact that you know, the NHS were accustomed to sometimes diverting people from a very busy hospital where there's a, a major incident, but a major incident was declared across all of London's hospitals and the situation, unfortunately, is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, so it's a really difficult situation. It's some, the first time, in, I think, in my time working in the NHS that I have been genuinely concerned about how we are going to manage to continue to care for our patients in the way that we'd like to because we are very near to being overwhelmed. Well, you're near to being overwhelmed, so does something have to happen very quickly in terms of adjusting the lockdown? Well, certainly, if you look at the measures that are in place now compared to the lockdown in March, um, and we weren't dealing with a mutant strain, which is more easily transmissible back in March, um, there were, um, it was a stricter lockdown in March, and there are, you know, there's, there are more relaxed rules about childcare. Uh, uh, yes, and, well, well, let me bring in Susan Mickey on that. Um, do you think uh, the rules need to change or people need to comply with the rules who are not complying now, perhaps because they're just exhausted and actually find it incredibly difficult financially and indeed mentally? Well, the evidence shows that people are adhering to the rules um, just as much as they were back in uh, June in the summertime. But what we are seeing is many people out and about, as we've heard earlier in the programme. But if you think about the much more lack lockdown we have this time, it's not surprising. We have mass gatherings in terms of nurseries and religious events. We have household contact, 
with cleaners, tradespeople, nannies going in and out of houses. We have a very wide uh, definition of critical worker now. Um, so we've heard that you know, up to 30% of classes, so people are still going into schools. All of that means much busier public transport. And you put all of that together, and it means that we're getting really mixed messages. On the one hand, the government's saying, we're locking down, stay at home. But on the other hand, they're saying, go out and do all these jobs. And if you think that compared to March, we now are in colder weather, so the virus survives longer, plus people spend much more time indoors where they're more at risk of aerosol transmission. And we have a variant that's somewhere between 50 and 70% more infectious. We should be having a stricter lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a more lax lockdown. Well, well, Dan Poulter, you know, we heard from Press Appears that there's a danger of the NHS being overwhelmed. And given what Susan Meekie said, and that, in fact, at Christmas, there were very rapid changes to the Christmas get-together rules, these rules are not designed to be revisited for another fortnight. But do you think, in the light of what you both practitioners are saying, and indeed people like you are saying, who are both a politician and a doctor, that the government actually needs to make an adjustment now to stop the NHS being overwhelmed. Yes, I, I do. And, and we, we need to look at things like, for example, um, rules on, um, I mean, just for example, mass uh, congregations for worship. Those things have got to be looked at. Do you think We've they should be stopped now? Well, if it was down to me, yes, I would stop it. And uh, we also uh, need to look at you know, the way the, this much greater, this wider definition of uh, key mm -hmm. worker that's been put in place in terms of schooling. And we've also got to look at possibly some of these issues around support bubbles um, and family bubbles, because um, you know, the, the risk is with one in three people um, being effectively asymptomatic, so having the virus but not knowing they've got it, you could well be mixing in a family bubble um, and infecting people um, uh, who you care and love, you love and care about. And uh, that's something that's happening every day at the moment. And we need to look at this um, and, uh, and, and take some, I think, more urgent action because, you know, the worst thing that we could see is, is, is a situation where it gets to the point where the NHS is, is systemically, not just in one or two hospitals, but systemically unable to cope for a prolonged period of time. And that's what we are at the moment facing. So it's time we need to revisit some of these measures and put in place tougher measures. They're difficult, but it's about saving lives um, and it's about making sure that the NHS is there for those who are really sick. But we know that some people are desperate because they just do not have enough money to cope despite measures being put in place. So the government presumably would have to move very quickly in a short term way to, to fill that gap if they want people, if they're desperately keen that people do not leave their homes. Absolutely. I mean, one thing, and I, I'm part of a group of MPs on the all part of parliamentary group on coronavirus, we have specifically made some recommendations to government about exactly that, that we need to find ways of better supporting people who will find it very economically tough and hard uh, not to be at work. And we've, that's an important part of this package. So what I'd hope to hear from is some, some more from the Chancellor next mm -hmm. week, um, tuck, coupled with some, tighten, some further tightening of the uh, measures that we already have yeah. in place, because you know the economics have got to go hand in hand uh, with the uh, healthcare restrictions, because uh, so, that's very important. And, and Susan, Susan Mickey, from your point of view, people presumably realise just how dangerous this new variant is. Do you think, if they were asked to make a bigger sacrifice within the next two weeks, that they would do it? Well, that's the history of the pandemic. When people see that there's a really big threat and that what they can do can make a difference and they have the support to make that difference, they will do it. But we mustn't forget that one of the most important things is keeping those people who are infected or might be affected away from the rest of the population, which was the whole purpose of test, trace and isolate. We mustn't forget that it's so important to get that up and running, but that requires supported isolation other countries pay people to stay at home. Other countries offer free hotel accommodation and visits every day when somebody is isolating for the 10 days to see if they're all right. Do they need any practical help with provisions or helping with their rubbish or whatever it might be? We're not doing any of these things in Thank this you. country. We're not being serious.